Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How in the world are you? Less than half the paper. Actually. And you can't help it. Right. By the way, that's my line. Get you know. <laughs> All righty then. I think Martin was the one that uh, he on uh, his uh, comedy show. He had a radio show, and every time he got on, he say, "What's up?" Where I was born, 
Bocas del Toro. And that's where my dad is. And so we were there at the airport, it's a small airport. And so the plane, of course, would be small. And in hindsight, thank God probably that the plane never come because, you know, sometimes these planes are not well kept. So anyway, so we are there standing, waiting, waiting, waiting with the team, like, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating this because for the first time in my life, my father would get a chance to see me play ball in the same position that he played, which was a pitcher. He was one of the best in his day, so, man, I got to get there, you know, show dad that, you know, um, chip off the old block. Well, I had to swallow my hopes because the plane never arrived and we had to go back home and set up for the other states that we would go, provinces that we go play in. But, you know, it hurt me, and, but I just had to handle it. You know, eventually I just had to let it go and keep playing ball. You know, I didn't know anything about Isaiah 40:31 at that time, so I just suck it up. You know, one of my coworkers shared something with me this week. Her brother is on stage four with cancer. And she is already sleeping because she's the one who's mostly taking care of him, going up and down, back and forth. Sometimes she sits in my classroom on the stool. And I'm here, I was going to say preaching. <laughs> I'm here teaching, and she's like this. And I'm like, oh, you're going to fall off this stool in a minute. You know, and so, but that's how exhausted she is. And, and, and she is just basically teetering on hope because you can see that she loves her brother dearly but this cancer that I call a bully is just eating up all her hope it's just eating away at her and I let her know you know I'm gonna pray for you and I pray for her and I will continue to pray for her and her brother but when you lose hope the song was still talking about a cloud but this cloud is dark it's menacing it's black you know, a technically call it a cumulative nimbus cloud, it's just soaking with water, just ready to just like break out with thunders and lightning and stuff, not in a good way. And so she is just like a pain on a thread of hope. But anytime I see her, I grab her hand and I try to encourage her that I'm praying for you, don't lose hope. You know, and, and sometimes the attitude that we get is that, that if we don't have hope, we lose sight that there is a chance that something can change. Someone can change. Amen? So, um, in Genesis, we all began with the story of hope. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and Adam and Eve, and for a moment, everything was going really well, we had hope, and then we lost it, they gave it up just for quick pleasure. No, just an instant pleasure. Let me get a taste here. And, you know, whole history of humanity changed in Genesis chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. We see that, you know, there was great hope for humanity for a minute, then it was all over. And so now we're in this place where we are, and it brings me to mind one character, um, Ralph Cramden, I don't know if you guys know the Honeymooners, He's always making promises to Alice because in his mind he hopes to change things. He wants to make a difference with her and then in the end, you know, he, he fails. The show would be the show unless he did. But um, there is hope for each and every one of us, right? Amen. I just want to encourage you because the songs that we were singing, if we don't believe the words that those songs are saying, there is no hope. There is no chance of being love, uh, loving, and there's no chance of surrendering. I want to share with you, um, again, back to baseball. I was up, bottom of the ninth, two men on base, two men out. I had two strikes on me. I'm a pitcher, so I'm there, and I'm waiting for a fastball to come. You know, and that's take my position, waiting for a fastball. Because if one of those guys on base would score, that means that the game would continue. So I'm there, you know, digging my cleats in that mud, and he pitches in and bam! Out of this field. Yeah, I wish it was that way. It didn't happen. I, I, you know, the guy threw this vicious curveball. I thought it was going to hit me, so I did this. The ball broke right here, and I'm like, oh, Lord. Strike! And he's out. 
And so in my mind was like, what are these guys going to say to me now? Are they going to criticize me? Are they going to get on my case? You know, you lost the game. All you had to do was get on base and we would take care of the rest. But you know what? As a baseball pitcher, I was hired to pitch. You know, I was good at it. I wasn't hired to be the hitter. And so the coach doesn't let us play warm up with the batters too often. We are mostly pitching. And so we need to understand what role we have in Christ as believers wherever we go, as it is our model. We represent Jesus. People will criticize us for doing certain things a certain way, but when we understand and know our position, our role, we can say, you know what? That's not what I was hired for. You know, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in what you just said. I don't believe in what you just did. This is my role. I represent Jesus in this way. All right? I just want to encourage you to understand it. So, the next thing we want to look at is, in baseball, there's always a team spirit. We encourage each other. As Christians, we learn to encourage each other. We don't look, I heard one pastor say that um, when you get to heaven, Jesus is not going to ask you about your large church, your multi church, your, your, your mega church. He's not going to ask you about how you did over the choir, how many CDs you sold, how many Grammys you won. Simple question is, so what did you do with my son, Jesus? Did you share him? Did you keep him for yourself? Well, that's going to be the bottom line. First thing I want to share is there are five different truths that we need to understand about who we are in Christ. Because if we don't know who we are in Christ, we will be like that man that is indecisive, you know, and just whatever wind of drought from that come, yeah, that sounds good, and makes some noise, you know. But anyway, he goes to the left, he goes to the right. One of the first things I want us to understand as believers. Because we can't hope in anything, we can't surrender anything unless we understand who we are. And so when we do that, when we choose to love, we understand why we're loving. When we choose to surrender, we understand why we are surrendering. So I want you to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The first thing is that we need to identify with these two verses is he is an apostle of Jesus Christ. He knows this. He doesn't have to be told this. He knows who he is in Christ. Secondly, he is talking about a specific group of people, the Jews, because the gospel has come, came first to them and then to us. And these people were pilgrims. You know, they don't have a specific place that they can say, this is my home. They were pilgrims. They are unstable, uncertain, you know. But let's look closely at verse 2. These people were elected by God himself. If anyone should have had hope, it would have been these people, the Jews. The Gentiles had no hope, but Jesus said, you know what, I came that all the world will have hope. Not only the Jews to them first, but also to the Gentiles. I want to share one experience about one of my co-workers, whom I've been sharing the Lord with and praying for, literally for about 20 years. One of the new employees that came to work, he is a pastor, Ramos, and the Lord has used him in such a way, I'm going to encapsulate the story. One day I'm coming in the back door, and I'm listening to an old gospel on my iPad as I'm walking, and she said, oh man, get rid of that, get rid of that. Let me show you the contemporary gospel. Now this woman is very colorful in her language. She can be very creative in cursing you out. And everybody knows Maria. And for Maria to tell me, let me tell you about, let me show you a contemporary gospel. That is just God's way of saying, you know what, you are hoping one day, because I asked him specifically, Lord, I want to be here when Maria changes. Because Maria has one of the filthiest mouths you could ever know. I mean, she's just notorious. And I said, I want to be here, Lord, when you do something in Maria's life. So I've been there, I've seen it, and God is able, so we need to continue trusting and hoping in God because he takes, he takes care of his work. And as faithful servants of God, we need to continue to work together in that. We can't be selfish and we can't be jealous of what God is doing in somebody else's life. We just pray continually for your brother and your sister. 
What are the other thing is the fellowship. This word fellowship. You know that when God chooses us, it's for intimacy. He doesn't like this long distance relationship. Reach out and touch. You know, he wants more than attempting to get to know to get to know us deeper inside and for us to do the same. We are a family, we are a family, you know the song, we are family, I've got my sisters and me, but we've got each other and we need to stick to each, uh, together, we need to encourage each other. And we are here because we have a specific purpose for each of us. No one is an island unto himself or herself. We were chosen to be a team, to act as one. We have to understand that God is behind all of this. We may not understand it, you know, but God is behind all of this. On this team, in this family, we move as one, one voice, because the hope is for all of us. There is no room for I, it is us, it is we, it is our. We cheer for each other, we don't, it doesn't matter if one gets strike out, you know, and you wanted him to, like me, you know, get at least get on base, get a walk something. You know, we encourage, we choose to encourage each other no matter what happens. If you look around at your brother and your sister, you realize that that person next to you is also somebody that God chose to be in His kingdom, chose for hope, chose to spread the good news. Secondly, God always treats me with mercy. Amen. You know, and it's something that we need to give each other. Uh, Tanisha, I was listening to your story. And um, I'm glad you chose to submit to <laughs> submit to God and not to your will, because the outcome, the results would have been a different, major difference. All right. Again, back in First uh, Peter one three, can somebody read that? First Peter one three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy began us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We know what we understand that we got all things impossible. Amen. Amen. And the way he treats us, we need to remind ourselves that's the way we need to treat each other. We cannot be hostile towards each other. And God's ability to choose us is part of what we do as a team. Alright? His abundant mercy, not just mercy, but a lot of it, a whole storehouse of it. I struck out, but I wasn't chosen again, like I said, to be a pitcher, but each of us is chosen to be a member of this body to bring hope to the world. And mercy. The guys actually showed me mercy. And I'd like for someone to just briefly, personally, just say to me, what does mercy mean to you? Let's start with you, Tanisha, since you brought up that story. What does mercy mean to you? Um, sometimes not getting a punishment or taking a consequence that you actually deserve. That's what mercy means to you. Amen. Someone else? Mercy. What does mercy mean? Compassion and understanding. Amen. We need to identify with these feelings. We need to identify with these truths because it's through that that we can look at others with love. We can submit to God and we can, like Phoenicia, chose to do the right thing because he realized that this was not going in the right direction. You know, let me submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Which is what he did. Alright. Now, we have inherited some things from God. We see that, for instance, myself, I inherited my talent from my dad and my good looks from, you know, your parents. <laughs> you know, but anyway, I didn't inherit any money from them. Too bad. But we have inherited some qualities from God, and this brings hope to each and every one of us. We look at it through our prayer time, the time we spend with God, the time we spend speaking to Him, listening to Him, 
and submitting to what he would have us to do instead of what we would do to our, uh, ourselves, we give hope and we bring hope. At my job, people ask me, how are you doing, Mr. King? And every single time, I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm blessed and highly favored. They look at I tell it to Jews, I tell it to Gentiles, I tell it to men, I tell it to women. And some of them right now are beginning to say, you know what, you are blessed. And you are highly favored. This I've convinced myself to say over and over because now it's just what comes out of me because I am blessed. And I am highly favored and so are you. And in Jeremiah chapter 29, we know what the word says. Lauren, you have your, you look cold. Alright, Jeremiah chapter 21 is our familiar verse about what God says about His plan towards us. But specifically, you have that on you? Uh, which verse? verse uh, chapter 29, verse 11. We all know that. For I know the plan that I have for you, says the Lord, but I'm not to, not to harm you, but to give you hope in the future. To give you what? Hope. There goes that HOP word again. So it's replete in the Bible in terms of what God's perspective is for us, what He wants and what He expects from us. He wants us to have hope. He wants us to know that it ain't always going to be cloudy. Amen. You know, it's not always going to be you taking matters into your own hand. We need to remember that with God, all things are possible and God desires to bring hope and fellowship with others who don't know Him. Amen? Amen? Now, God makes promises to us because He can fulfill it. And He intends to fulfill it. He doesn't say what He doesn't intend on doing. We make mistakes, we say things just to get out of a situation, but when God makes promises, if He says this is what He is going to do, we can bank on it, and this is exactly what He's going to do. And many times we've been held captive to things and situations that we just can't understand. For instance, if you look at, uh, I'll read it in the message. It's the story, a quick story. We're going to take a quick look at the lady, the woman with the issue of blood. I've always read it and I've never went beyond that she was bleeding, she was losing blood. But someone, Pastor, Pastor T.D. James, he brought up something very interesting that I never thought of. She said that because of the laws of the Jews back in the days, she was not only losing blood, she was losing love, she was losing family, she was losing friends, she was losing finances, she was using the ability to socialize with the people she cared most. They had to leave her by herself because of the laws of that nation about people who were losing blood and she was going through this not for one year, not for two years, for 12 years, wanting and desiring to be with her loved ones, wanting and desiring like, you know, I'm, I'm getting crazy here, I can't talk to anybody because I have to be isolated from everyone and everything. I used to have money, now I'm broke. Because remember what the Word says, she just gave everything. So she had means in issue. Alright, so I'm just going to quickly go through this with you. A large crowd followed Jesus and pushed very close around him. Among them was a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered very much from many doctors and had spent all the money she had. But instead of improving, she was getting worse. When the woman heard about Jesus, See, this is what the world needs to hear. They don't need to hear about God. There's a difference. You can talk about God all day long in a room. But as soon as you mention the name Jesus, you know, it changes the game. Ears are, you know. Alright, so as soon as she hears, she heard about Jesus. Uh, when the woman heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his coat. She thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Instantly, her bleeding stopped, and she felt it in her body, and she was healed from her disease. 
She suffered 12 years. Instantly. All those 12 years. All the isolation. All the loss that she's been experiencing. It's in the past now. That's what people would say. Really bad. You know? It's in the past. It's gone. It's over with. Instantly. You know, so we may be going through, you know, prisons in our minds, in our bodies, in relationships, finances, jobs, education, and we may be experiencing this for years and years, and we sit and we wonder, is this ever going to end? You know, when will there be a chance for me to, like, be on the other side? Then you hear about this man that's walking in the crowd and everybody's bumping him, but nobody's drawing any essence out of him. Nobody's drawing the anointing out of him. They're just there because it's a show. I want to see what's going on. I want to see what he does next, who he heals next. But this woman had a purpose. She had hope in him. She said, I know this is probably the dirtiest part of him because it's a dusty place, you know, not Jerusalem, desert. You know, but if I can just touch the, the little dirty part of his clothes, it doesn't matter. I believe in my heart that I, everything will be all right. I'm going to get healed. My suffering is going to be over. This is my greatest hope. And this is my last chance. Because the doctors didn't do me any good. They told me to go get chemo. You know, but what chemo does, it eases the cancer for a little while, but then when the cancer comes back, it's more vicious than before, and so it's going to take me out. So they couldn't do me any good. But then I heard a crowd and they were talking about a man named Jesus and that he was doing all kinds of miracles. And I wondered to myself, maybe, just me, if I make my way through this crowd. I know it's against the law to be in the public. I know it's against the law to be close to anyone because of my condition. But that's my last hope. I don't care who says what. I don't care who is bothered with me. That's my last hope. And I am desperate. I am so desperate. They could kill me on my way to Jesus if they want to, but that's my last hope. And so she made her way. She forced her way. And she got down to the hem of the garment, the Bible says. She was healed. I read the pastor said by a thread. That's it. The hem of his garment, she was healed by a thread. All these people bouncing up and down and bumping Jesus. All of a sudden, this woman touches and he feels that virtue come out of him. What does he say? And once Jesus felt the power to go out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched me? <laughs> come on, Jesus. It's real serious. His disciples, that was their reaction. Yo. What do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you. No, 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 no. This was different. This was a different touch. This was a touch of faith. Somebody had a purpose in touching me. Somebody had a reason to touch me. And I felt that. It came, it came right out of me. That anointing came right out of me because this person came to me with a purpose. They weren't just praying, they were yearning, they were on their face, prostrate before me because they wanted to get something done. And this was their last hope. So she couldn't care what the law said. You know, the law said you have to allow anyone that wants to go in the bathroom, use the bathroom. The law says you can't do this and you can't go there. The law says, you know what the disciple says, we would rather obey God. This woman couldn't care less. She was just desperate. I'm dead anyway. I can't be with my family. I can't be with my husband. I can't be with my best friends. You know, even my house. I'm here by myself. It's, I'm dead anyway. Kill me. Just finish me off. So she made her way through. I gotta touch Jesus. And it's when we get desperate, when we get to that place where we, our hope is the last thing we can hold on to because after that it's over. So she made it. She got what she wanted because she was hoping in the right place. 
and the right person. The doctors that she hoped in, she also had hopes, but they got to their limits. They could do but so much. So then, Jesus can do so much more. Amen? So she went and she got what she wanted and she was restored. The Bible says instantly. It was over. So I don't know what each of you is going through personally. I don't know how long you've been going through it. God knows. But I'm here to encourage you that the same God that she touched is the same God that you can touch. Alright? You don't have to grab a hold of his hand. Just grab a hold of faith in what he said. He's not here for us to touch him physically, but he's here in his word. We can always touch him. He says the door is open. Amen? Amen. Thirdly, God has secured a place for you. He has secured a place for me. He has provided, like I had inherited some stuff from my parents, God has provided an inheritance that is incorruptible, is undefiled, does not fade away, we cannot lose it. It is reserved in heaven for you and for me. Speaking of which, one of my co-workers that I've known Bailey for over 25 years, I think, got a text on Tuesday, uh, got a text yesterday. Um, he had moved to New Jersey, was assistant principal at my school. He was working as an assistant principal in Jersey, got a text that he passed on. You know, he's not with us anymore. But Bailey was a man of God. So one of my coworkers said, well, he's got his mansion now. He's looking at his mansion. I said, you know what, hey, that's what we all hope for. He had hope that, he, you know, it's like the three Hebrew boys, or even Job. You know, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though that fire will kill me, you can throw me, toss me in it anyway. But I just want you to know that the God that I serve is able to deliver me. The God that you serve, the God that I serve, is able to deliver us. We need to bear that in mind. In, 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 in the conclusion, there's a poem I just want to read, and it's a poem called Hope. I refuse to be discouraged, to be sad, or to cry. I refuse to be downhearted, and here's the reason why. I have a God who is mighty, who is sovereign and supreme. I have a God who loves me, and I am on his team. He is all wise and powerful. Jesus is his name, though everything is changeable. My God remains the same. My God knows all that's happening, beginning to end. His presence is my comfort. He's my dearest friend. When sickness comes to weaken me, to bring my head down low, I call upon my mighty God. Into His arms I go. When circumstances threaten to rob me from my peace, He draws me close unto His breast, where all my striving cease. And when my heart melts within me and weakness takes control, he gathers me into his arm. He soothes my heart and soul. The great I am is with me. My life is in his hand. The Son of the Lord is my hope. It's in his strength I say. I refuse to be defeated. My eyes are on my God. He has promised to be with me as through this life I trod. I, uh, I am looking past all my circumstances to heaven's throne above. My prayers have reached the head of God. I am resting in His love. I give God thanks in everything. My eyes are on His face. Then the battle's His. The victory is mine. He will help me in this race. Amen. Amen.